Pastor Dean opened the doors of this church so that people that are hurting and dying that need Jesus to open their eyes, to unstop their ears, to drive the cancer out, can find out today he is still the same now that he was then. hand clap you've ever given anybody in anticipation for a tremendous night in God's presence. How many of you have been blessed this week? Is there anybody here that fr Friday, this Friday night, you drove in from somewhere and this is your first night in the meetings this week. Where'd you folks come in from? Alpine, Texas. How, how far is that? How far? How about if you're driving legally? Three and a half? Well, I'm glad you came. Welcome our friends from Alpine, Texas. How many of you were here in the daytime, 11 o'clock? We said we were gonna call last night this breakthrough Friday and the morning was great. And we're gonna cap it off. Tomorrow you can go have fun with your family. I was gonna say do whatever you want, but these days, do whatever you want within reason. And uh, we'll come back Sunday morning and night, and then just night services, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as we head into the Christmas season. My wife comes in tomorrow night with uh, Camila, so she'll be here next week. She's looking forward to seeing you. But God has something for you tonight. Amen. Lift both hands to the Lord. Father, I thank you for breakthrough. I thank you for all you've done already. I thank you for all the miracle reports that we've heard. You are an awesome God, and we are in awe of who you are. Now I pray for every person that's here and every family that's either here or represented by a member here. I pray that they would experience what we see all through Scripture, breakthrough, an end to sorrows, an overflow of blessing in every area of life. Pray for those that are watching online that are in their homes, those that are watching in other countries that can't go to church because they're coward leadership bowed to the government. I pray you'd use this meeting to invade their home with the anointing and touch and change the people that are in their homes. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it and give you praise. And all God's people said, Amen. give the Lord another great hand clap and you can be seated. I want you, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. If you're watching online, I'd like after the meetings, I'm going to look back at the comments and I'd love to see where you're watching from. So put the city and the state and the country. Sometimes people think everybody lives in their town, so they'll just write like Smithfield, but that could be anywhere. So uh, t town, state, or province, and whatever nation you're in. Joshua chapter 1, verse 2. If you're there, can you say amen? amen. Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I've already given to you. From the Negev. Now, when we got our first building about four years ago, uh, first office building I ever got, there's a theologian, he's in heaven now, his name was Finnis Dake. And he had two rules for Bible interpretation. He said, take the Bible literally wherever possible, and where not possible, search for the literal meaning. So what separates a lot of ministers and churches is they don't take the Bible literally. So they'll read your story about how Jesus healed the blind man, and they'll say, how many of you know sometimes we're spiritually blind? You were my server at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings last night, weren't you? Ah, oh, glad you came. Nice to see you. Welcome, my friend. One of the few people I met outside of church while I was here. Good to see you. Sorry to embarrass you. I just, 
I wanted to make sure I didn't get, I wasn't like, somebody didn't put like drugs in my meal and I was hallucinating. <laughs> glad you're here. Uh, when we got that office building, oh, I'm glad I'm not, glad I'm not on uh, psychedelic drugs without knowing it, always a good thing. <laughs> so when we got that building, it kind of it kind of came into our possession the same way this one did where it all happened without me having anything to do with it and i went in it when it was all finished so what i did was when i came home from preaching one night i drove to where it was and i decided i was going to walk around the property and and both consecrate the property to the lord and thank god for the building and just pray and give, give him thanks and and this scripture was in, in my heart wherever the sole of your foot shall tread You'll be on land that I've already given you. So I walked around it. I thank God for his protection. I thank God for turning the building over to us easily. Never took an offering. Never did, did charity golf tournament to raise money. Nothing like that. So as I got ready to round the corner of the building, I felt the Lord speak to me. Walk around the other building too. So I did. And that building wasn't mine. And I felt the Lord with that scripture. Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread. You'll be on land that I've already given you. So I walked around it. Thank God for that one too. And that's easy to do. It was two in the morning. I was coming back from a, another meeting. Nobody was around. So it's easy to have faith and do weird things when no one's looking. Amen. <laughs> if it was middle of the work day, been, uh, I might have been a little more timid. So what, interesting that a year and a half later, my, as many of you heard, we outgrew that first building. And my Uncle Ted, that's a prophet, stepped out and pointed at that building and said, that's your next move. The Lord's going to give you that building. And I told him, not in unbelief, but I said, uh, the building just sold to someone else three months ago. And he said, when you find out that the sale fell through, that's the sign that the building is yours. And so the, six days later, that was Tuesday, on Monday, the owner called and told us that those people haven't made one payment. And for some reason, as I was coming to padlock it today, I was thinking, even though you bought the one across the alley, if you want the second one, I'll give it to you for a good deal because I'm not getting anything for it anyway. And so the Lord made that one happen. No letters, no fundraiser. Because I took the Bible literally. You know, you're, well, hey, they say whatever. I'm telling you, if you look at this, whether it's the anointing with oil, whether it's the laying on of hands, whether it's the promise that wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, you'll be on land that I've already given you. Now, obviously... One of the reasons people back off of preaching that is because you ha always have in any group of people, church people included, you have a certain percentage of morons that are going to go on their neighbor's property at two in the morning and start walking around and claiming the land and you're going to get shot. But if you'll use the scripture with, uh, uh, with a good mind and when you start looking, when you start outgrowing your business, as God begins to expand things, as your housing needs change. Whatever, if you start, instead of saying, I don't know what we're going to do, if you start opening up the eyes of faith and realize wherever your foot will tread, God will give you the land where your feet are. Now, I want to give you an even broader principle. Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, you'll be on land that I've already given to you. When you step on the land, the atmosphere changes. When you step on the land, dominion shifts from who had it before to who has it now. Almost everywhere I would go, because you, most of you know, unless you're just coming here for the first night, I'm a traveling preacher. So when I started out, now it's different because I'm on online or some television. So people have seen me before. But everywhere I used to go, I was going cold. And uh, they didn't know how I preached. And I was young. And a lot of times, and, and I would guess 100% of the people in the crowd have dealt with this. That when people have stopped at a certain level, they try to discourage you from going any further than that level. Whether they say it's because you're young. Like let's say you're 14 and you start getting a dream that you want to play Major League Baseball. You're doing pretty good in Hobbs playing around here and you want to go to the majors. Well, you're going to have people in your own family. You might not have one person encourage you. You might have it in your own family. Now listen, I know you're doing good down here in New Mexico, but you got to remember there's people in Arizona and Texas, and this is just a small league. People, for whatever reason, go out of their way to discourage people from believing that they can have the best. But when you read the Bible, you find out it's not just some dream you're coming up with. God's best. God did not create this world for the, for the devil's children to enjoy it. God created this world for his children to enjoy it. Can you say amen? 
Yeah. If God, if you like to fish, God made the fishing. If you like to hunt, God made the hunting. Whatever you like to do, it's not like God saying, well, I hope none of my people ever, ever fly on an airplane. I made that for the devil's people, you know, but the world will shape your thinking into apologizing or feeling like you have no business having the best. Meanwhile, you watch guys like Jeffrey Epstein that own planes just to fly people to an island to rape children, but you'll never hear a word about that from the media. What, why did he have a jet? But then if a preacher gets one or you got one, all of a sudden, what does he need that for? What does she need that for? I pray the word of God will reprogram you tonight that you won't concede the best of life to heathens. You'll realize that God gave you something that's called dominion to go and possess the land. If you receive that tonight, put those anointed New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, Tennessee hands together and let God know that you believe his word that the best of life belongs to you. And I, I appreciate you coming all week this close to Christmas. One of the things I'd hear when I started preaching, you know, no one's around and Christmas is a terrible time to do meetings because everybody's in holiday mode. Well, sadly, those people had never been to Hobbs, New Mexico, where apparently not only does no one care that there's a mass mandate, nobody cares that it's Christmas. They just love Jesus and want to hear the Bible. Amen. And so the thing you're going to have to fight in life isn't so much the devil. You're going to have to fight with people, and when I say fight, I don't mean argue with them on Facebook. I mean, but you're going to have to fight internally with the words that people that are even in your own camp, people that are supposed to support you, will give you to tell you why you can't do it, why you're not smart enough. You know, you have a family now, and you have, you have to think. You can't really dream like that. You have a child to take care of. I'm not talking about being delinquent in your responsibilities, but I'm saying God made you in his image. God made you the best. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives in your spirit. The same spirit that created the earth and moved over the waters. It lives on the inside of you. That should start giving you a mentality that I don't have to settle for what life gives me. I can use my faith and take what belongs to the children of God. Come on, if you receive that, go ahead and shout a living amen. amen. Say right out loud, the best of life, best of life. belongs to me. So you need to have a mentality that where you go, however things work for other people, it's going to work differently for you. Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, you'll be on land that I've given to you. I'm going to give you two more illustrations of that because I've used that exactly uh, three times in my life. One was for those buildings. The, second, uh, the first time I ever did it was when we had outgrown our ministry vehicle which was my, also my personal vehicle. I didn't have a 501c3 yet because there was no need to have one. There was no leftover money. There was no, you know, everything that came in went to the ministry and then we took a small, once you deducted business expenses, we made, Adonis and I made so little money that when we mailed in our state taxes, the state of Virginia mailed it back with a letter basically saying that in good conscience they, they couldn't take our money. Because we only made like, I think we cleared like $7,200. So, the, you know, they basically sent us a letter letting us know we're poor. And uh, please avail yourself of, of our state services for health care and feeding programs. And I read that letter and I called across the apartment to Adonis. I said, hey, Adonis, we're officially poor. And we laughed. Because honestly, I never felt poor. Even reading that letter and saying that, I was just joking around. I never felt poor. I dress like this. I talk like this. I preach like this. In fact, just to, sometimes if, if, if money ran really low in the bank, just to irritate the devil, I would think like if one time I went to go preach in Vermont and the, the bank that we used, Bangor Savings Bank, the, the, um, they, were, they had such low technology. This is like mid-2000s, 2005 or six, six or seven. They, they wouldn't give you a digital receipt for your deposit. The teller would write your balance on a piece of paper and give it to you. So she wrote that we had like $216 in the bank. Now, now that's total. That's not like I had some big 401k that I didn't want to touch. That was, there was no savings account. There was no nothing. That was, we had $216. So I had to go to Vermont to preach. And we had a credit card that I think had about a $150 balance 
once it was paid off. I mean, like the most we could use it for was 150. We had no credit. And so, uh, okay, I got $216 to get there. I'd already booked my hotel, so that was paid for. So whatever. Then we'll just see what happens once we get to where I'm preaching and, and see what the Lord does. But I got enough to get there. Well, I stop on the way for a Red Bull at a, at a gas station. And then we stop for Taco Bell on the way, my wife and I. And then, you know, you got to treat your wife right. Amen. <laughs> it's one of the secrets to staying married. You got to give them the best. <laughs> Dallas, order anything you want. So, so <laughs> we, keep, we keep driving. And then, and then when we get to the hotel, Dallas has a bunch of alerts on her phone that you've overdrawn your account. Your new balance is minus $337. So I was thinking, how in the world are we at minus $337? I know I didn't eat that much Taco Bell. <laughs> well, that lady that gave us our balance and wrote $216, the actual balance was that it was still overdrawn, like $100. So when I stopped for the Red Bull for me and Adalas, it was $350 for each Red Bull, $7.00. Plus a $37 overdraft fee for the first Red Bull and a $37 overdraft fee for the second Red Bull. That's an expensive drink. That's about the most expensive non-alcoholic beverage you can have. And then uh, we finish that. Then we go to Taco Bell. Well, we order whatever, $8 worth of fake Mexican food. And then they tack on another $37. We might have stopped for water on the way, another $37. So we... We rattled up another 200 and some dollars worth of charges. Now we're at minus three something. Our credit card has a little bit left on it. And, and I, you know, you don't really feel anointed. You actually feel that Saturday night. You think, what am I doing going to preach to people? Lo, let me tell you how to have success in life. Using these principles, I've been able to accumulate negative $337 in the bank. You feel like telling the pastor, why don't you go have somebody else that knows what they're doing preach? Probably anybody in the congregation is doing better than me. I have to go park my car out in the weeds because it's smashed in in the back. It's a disgrace to the blood of Jesus, you know. And so you don't feel anointed. I know what it feels like. Believe me. I know what it feels like for somebody in a suit and tie to stand up and tell you these promises out of the Bible and talk about how the Lord gave them a building and you're saying amen, but then half of you is like gritting your teeth and you're like, keep telling me more things you have. I'm going to punch you in the face. I don't want to hear about it because I know the feeling. Well, I had to go preach. Now, it'd be one thing if I was preaching at a church like this. This is what I would call a high quality church. It has high quality people. The pastor's not a cheapskate. He's done well in life. And, and, and I could give a lot of other compliments, but I'm a very mean person. So I'm stopping right there. This was a church that on Sunday morning had about 21 people in a little town in Vermont. I don't even know if it's open or, or not anymore. I mean, 21 people, nobody, next to nobody. And then the pastor was broke. And the pastor would tell you on the way into church, you know, well, I hope the Lord blesses you while you're here, but our people don't give much and my wife and I don't have much. So you already have a negative bank balance plus him. It's like, Lucifer, would you like to come and have a chat with me before I go, just to finish it off? It's one of those pastors that when he got done talking to you, you started looking for rope and a ceiling beam strong enough to support your weight. Our people don't really enjoy preaching, and we have a lot of problems in this church. And it's like, good Lord, you got a loaded revolver I can use? So when that happened... I went, I went, I decided because what did I feel like in my flesh? I felt like I shouldn't even be preaching, let alone, I, I, you know, in your flesh. You think, and then if I do preach, I'm certainly not going to talk about blessing. I'm not blessed. I'm not going to talk about it. I don't know what to talk about. I'm practically the most well-dressed bum in this state. <laughs> and the Lord put something in my spirit when that happened. No, don't say what you feel, say what you believe. I have a book coming out January 18th. It's called How to Dominate in a Wicked Nation, Lessons from the Life of Abraham. I started studying the life of Abraham that week in Vermont. 
because I made up my mind. Okay, I understand what you're saying, Lord. If this is an attempt of the devil to discourage me and discourage me in the realm of finances, then I'm going to preach on the blessing of Abraham. And whether that's why when the pastor said, you know, I don't know what our people are going to do about your preaching. I actually thought, I don't care. I actually don't care if anybody shows up. I'm going to study during the day and I'm going to preach this for me. I'm going to preach it so the devil can hear that I don't care what you do to me. I don't care how, how much things get messed up. I believe God's word. I declare God's word and it shall be just as he said. 21 people. Nighttime, 28 people. Then the next night, Monday night, crowd was up to almost 40 because some Mennonite people, you know, they're not just in Seminole, there's some in Vermont. They got lost. Some Mennonite people heard we were having a revival and they came to the meeting. I'd never had Mennonite people in our, our meeting before. And whatever I preached Monday night, they liked it. So they invited more Mennonite people. By Wednesday night, we had 80 people we started with 21. It seated 40. We had a little over 80 people Wednesday night. They were sitting along the windowsills on the back of that little church. They were all over. You know, thank God there was no, if you preach far enough out in the country, there's no fire marshal. There's no permits. So everybody was packed in there. And there's all these Mennonite guys wearing the same color suspenders with their Bibles listening to that. And as that happened, then the, the, the offering was supernatural. I didn't take, I think I waited till the last two nights to take an offering. I wasn't doing it trying, trying to get money out of people because I already had my hotel and everything, and I fasted that week. Easy to fast when you have minus $300. Can't buy any food. <laughs> Even when the devil tempts you to eat, you say, listen, buddy, I don't know how to tra change rocks to bread, and I don't have any money to buy bread, so you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> and I fasted. And instead of getting discouraged and quitting... I decided to look at what my father Abraham did in the faith and then speak what he spoke. And as it happened, it started to build in my spirit that I'm not a white man with minus $300. I'm a son of God with access to heaven's bank accounts and that God has the ability to overwhelm what's happened to me. You know, what are you going to do when you're, when you're in Vermont in that situation? Because I, I couldn't make a case. If I told them the lady told me that I, I threw the paper away, I have no proof. Even if I had the paper, it's just a paper that says $216 on it. There's no signature, so I couldn't say this is actually your fault. Can you please help me? No. I, I was, I was uh, not in good shape. I'm starting to think of a church way to say it. You, know, you don't want to say screwed in front of all these nice people. So I was not in good shape. And uh, you, I realized that day, young in my ministry, that you can turn to God. And you can turn to God's word. And you can begin to speak God's word. And God's word, the first thing that it'll, it'll do is it'll start to lift up your own spirit. God's word is heavenly food to your own spirit. Can you say amen? amen. And so instead of feeling dejected, the Bible says when David was at the point where his men were going to kill him. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, if you can learn to encourage yourself in the Lord, then you don't have to wait for me to come by or, 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 or some anointed person to get a word about your life and give you some, some good words. You can learn to speak the word of God and say, I don't care what the outside circumstances look like. I'm not what my circumstances are. I am what the Bible says I am. Somebody say, wherever the sole of your foot, the of your foot shall, tread, shall tread, I'll be on land, be on land that, God that God has given me. What ministry starts to grow? The Lord speaks to me about going on television. So we buy television equipment. I don't have any staff. My wife is the camera operator. My wife is the camera setup lady. You know, just going at it. I had a Toyota Camry with, a, with about 180,000 miles on it. And we loaded all the camera equipment our suitcases into that Toyota Camry. Well, they're not designed to hold that. My trunk was weighed down. The, uh, the back was weighed down. And then we had to not only pack the trunk in the back seat, we didn't have Camila yet. We packed it so it went up between the two seats to the windshield. So my wife and I couldn't even talk while we drove. It cut down on the fighting immensely because we couldn't even see each other. 
And that car wasn't meant to drive like that. And uh, driving around low, I looked like I was delivering heroin to the town instead of the gospel. I was driving around a low rider Toyota. So we finally got a little extra money in the bank. And I knew that I was destroying that car. It wasn't meant to be used like that. And I knew I needed an SUV. But SUVs, they're not giving them away. Well, I had seen, that was back when the Cadillac Escalade kind of relaunched and they made their, their, the new body type. Not the one they have now. This is like 2012 probably. A few years down the road from Vermont. And I had enough to get one, but it would have cleaned my whole bank account out. And I talked to my, my dad and some other older ministers and they said, I said, yeah, it probably isn't wise at 30 years old to pull into town with the reputation that evangelists have anyway, that all they want is people's money and you drive in looking like you're going to pull off a robbery. So I said, you know, I'll probably get it. I'll probably get like a, at 30, I'll get like a Chevy Tahoe or a Suburban. And my dad said, well, it's not only that, you also do a lot of preaching. You know, like those crusades we would do in the bad part of the projects. So he said, you don't need to be riding in and be a target. So I said, you're right. So I wanted an Escalade, but I thought, well, it'd be less money and I'll go get that. I want you to say a scripture with me. We're not in Sunday school, but you're going to learn a few verses tonight. Psalm 37, verse 4. Say, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Everybody say the first part again. Say, delight yourself in the Lord. Now, there's a certain element that has to be in your faith where the Bible says in Hebrews 11, they staggered not at the promises of God, but grew strong and were empowered by faith, and they kept moving forward. God will allow circumstances. I don't mean sickness. I don't mean bankruptcy. But God will allow you to be in a couple of spots where you have the opportunity to quit. Where family's telling you to quit. Where people you thought would encourage you will encourage you to quit. You did your best. Sometimes things don't work out. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with, you know, regrouping and trying again sometime in the future. And if you'll make up your mind, I'm committed to God's word. I will not quit. You're going to find something out. Two things. Number one, the Bible says one of the fruit of the spirit is perseverance. Everybody say Perseverance. Perseverance is maintaining your original integrity and motives and operation in the midst of adversity. Not to bring up football analogies, but I had my uh, cousin with me at the beginning of this trip, and he loves football. He's a big Steeler fan. He doesn't live in Pittsburgh. I live in Pittsburgh, and I, I pretty much quit watching the NFL. When they introduced male cheerleaders, you lost me. So, uh, uh, you guys like them? Hey, not everybody's the same. So... He was watching the Steeler game, and they were down last week. It was the Thursday night game. They were down 23 nothing at halftime, and they came back and almost won that game. That's perseverance. They actually, I think they had it tied up at one point. If they'd have pulled it off, they missed it by one point. It would have been the largest comeback in NFL history. That's called perseverance. Because at halftime, it'd be easy to say, well, we'll get a loss. We still have about half the season left. But perseverance doesn't quit. Number one, if you decide to have perseverance, perseverance is not a fruit of the devil. Perseverance is a fruit of the spirit. Say this out loud. If I don't quit, the devil will quit. If you read in the Bible, the devil's a quitter. He gave three shots at Jesus, and when Jesus answered him with the word, he left. Satan it will leave you. The Bible says Satan left him alone for a season. So if you press forward, there will come a time where the devil will bow out and look for easier opposition. Receive that tonight in Jesus' name. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. Then the second thing you find out is if you persevere, since it's a fruit of the Spirit, you actually gain uh, the approval of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, holy men of old gained God's approval by faith. So there are people that God smiles on differently than he smiles with others. Everybody doesn't operate at the same level of favor. Some people cross bridges with God. I preached for a man uh, that built the largest, in fact, he's still the pastor there. He built the largest Pentecostal church in the nation of Canada. He's still the senior pastor, preaches every Sunday. He's almost 90. 
Doesn't use a cane or anything. Very sharp dressed. He told me the story about how when he built his first church in Canada, that even back then, the local government told him he had to shut down. They were fining him for permit stuff. All, all this, trying to shut him down. And he said, finally, the permit man came in and I had had enough. He said, I picked up my shovel and went at him. And I said, you're not shutting this church down. He forgot he had the shovel in his hand. It looked like he was like coming to kill him. He said, I'm, I'm, I don't care what your position is. You listen to me. You're not shutting this church down. He said, I'm going to build the rest without any permits with the shovel. He said, we're going to have church this Sunday and I'm not stopping. Do you understand? He said, the guy looked frightened and turned out and ran. And the next day, all of the permits were delivered to the church. I'll give you another one. Anybody ever hear of Dr. Lester Summerall? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Lester Summerall at the time built the second largest church in the United States. He had come back as an Assemblies of God missionary from the Philippines, and the Lord sent him to South Bend, Indiana. So he goes, takes over the Assemblies of God church there. They quickly outgrow it, and he wants to build a 2,000-seat church, which would be the second biggest in the country, and the mayor there, even back then, what do you need a church that big for? What does any pastor need? It? You know, they never say, what do you need a casino that big for? Or what do you need a liquor store? But when you start doing holy things, it messes with the demonic system. Can you say amen? amen. So they tell him uh, that 78 neighbors filed a petition that the land that he bought, if he clears those trees, those trees are the home of the squirrels, and it'll displace them. Now, I got this story straight from his son. He said, when my dad got that paper, he went straight down to the mayor's office with no appointment, walked by the receptionist. This is a 60-year-old pastor. With, went into the room, and he said he sat on the mayor's desk, not in the chair. He said when he walked in, the mayor said, have a seat, Reverend. He said, I don't want to sit in your office. Sat on the desk, on the mayor's side of the desk, and said, I got your letter that 78 families have signed a petition that they don't want me to clear the land. He said, well, that's right. He said, now you listen to me. I have 1,000 families in my church, not 78 people. If you don't give me the permits, I'm going to give every one of them a placard, and we're going to march downtown until you wish you weren't a dog catcher. I said to his son, what happened? He said he had the permits in less than 15 minutes. Because there is a boldness that the devil backs off. There is a boldness that the devil respects. There's one language that the devil understands, and that language is power, and that language is boldness. If you don't back down, the devil will back down. And that's why God gives you boldness by the Holy Spirit. I prophesy in the name of Jesus, every attack against you, everything the devil's been doing to try to back you down and shut you up and get you to take a seat on this breakthrough night, the Lord fills you with boldness to prevail and never take a backward step. <laughs> Say it so the devil can hear you. Say, I'm not backing down. I'm backing down. Say, I'm going forward. I'm going forward. Now lift your hands and begin to thank God out of your mouth that he's given you the victory. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, in order to go to that other dealership, to get the Chevy Suburban. I had to drive by the Cadillac dealership in Pittsburgh. And as I drove by it, I was already committed to get the other vehicle. Happy to save the money and all that. I felt the Lord speak to me, go to the dealership, go to the Cadillac, pull into the Cadillac dealership. So I did. He didn't say I had to buy one. So I pulled in and I got out. And there was a salesman there and I figured I'd just make small talk with him. I didn't have to commit to buying anything. And all of a sudden, as that salesman's talking to me, his boss comes over and says, are you Jonathan Shuttlesworth? I said, yeah. He said, I went to hear you preach in Washington, Pennsylvania. That's about 45 minutes from where our church is going to be, one county south. And he said, my son had Tourette's syndrome so badly with his verbal tics that the public school paid us to homeschool him because they couldn't conduct class with my son in there. And he said, he went to summer camp, and uh, we saw you preach, and we sent him to the summer camp the week you were doing the camp, and he got baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues. And he said, after he spoke with other tongues, he never had another verbal tick. So we were able to send him back to school. 
And we were able to, um, you know, he can play football and everything again. He said, were you looking to buy a Cadillac? I thought, well, I wasn't, but I am now. Now I feel like Oral Roberts and Elijah and Moses rolled into one. Amen. After that testimony, he said, so he says to the salesman, Bob, I'll, I'll take this one. You can go back inside. So he says, now listen, I don't know if you'd be interested or not, but this is a one-year-old black Cadillac extended cab SUV, the same one I needed. Or I need an extended cab. He said, uh, somebody just turned it in, and he said, we just put two new tires on it. He said, come to the office. If you're interested, he showed me their paperwork. This is how much we paid for it. This is how much the new tires cost and whatever else they did. I still remember it was like $768. So he said, I'll sell it to you so that the dealership breaks even. I'll give it to you for what we paid for it plus the cost of the new tires if you're interested. Well, would you know that that black Escalade, because of that deal, was going to be cheaper than the Suburban or the Tahoe that I was going to get trying to save money? Because when you delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord gives you the desires of your heart. And see, what people don't understand when that kind of stuff happens is it's not just about the Cadillac. It's not just about it being a nice car. It's about every time you walk into your driveway, you got a testimony speaking to you that God cares about even the little desires of your heart, that you're not some insignificant person to God. He cares for you. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon God, for he careth for you. I want you to say it so the devil can hear you. Say, God cares about me. Say, he even cares about the desires of my heart. So I learned a lesson there. Everybody say, the sole of your feet. feet. Things change if you'll actually go and check the place out. The devil will try to tell you places you can't eat. That place is expensive. Said who, you? Who are you, Bill Gates? People tell you stuff's expensive. They don't even know what expensive is. Then if you ask them, uh, there's, there's a restaurant. You might have seen, they used to run commercials for it nationally. It's called Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And I like steak. And so they would run the commercial. they say, man, we serve this on a 500-degree buttered plate. That sounds dangerous for no reason, but that's what they do. <laughs> but the steaks look good. So one time, they opened one up in Pittsburgh, and I asked some preachers I was with, I said, let's go eat at that Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Oh, that place is expensive. They said, uh, everything's a la carte. I've never heard that word before. So what's a la carte? We don't know either. We just hear other people. <laughs> I just heard other people say that and it makes you sound like you're an intellectual cheapskate. <laughs> when we walked by that restaurant and they said we can't eat there, I made up my mind, I'm going to eat there. Yeah. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how many felonies I have to commit, <laughs> but I'm going to eat at that place. I, maybe it's just I have like an ornery streak or a contrary streak. But if somebody tells me something can't be done, no one's ever held the revival meeting in this town that grew. I started thinking, I'm going to grow it. I don't care if I have to tase the townspeople and bring them in roped up. Don't tell me what I can't do. The Bible said, I said, don't tell me what I can't do. All things are possible to him who believes. I want that to get in your spirit tonight. All things are possible to him who believes. Your family might have mapped out a small future for you. People might have mapped out a small future for you. But there's a God that doesn't make small plans for anybody. God has a big plan with your name on it. And if you'll join hands with him, he'll take you to the top in Jesus' mighty name. Well, my wife and I started a church, which ended up being two churches, 17 miles apart, but they're a treacherous 17 miles apart, in um, the east side of Maui, in Hawaii. Well, if you go to the other side of Maui, it's where all the resorts are, and one day we got there a little early, like a day early, before we had to drive back and start preaching. This is before we had Camila, just me and her in Hawaii, and I saw they had a Ruth's Chris in a town called Wailea. Well, to give you a little tip from somebody that's been traveling for 40 years, if you ever get a chance to go to Wailea, after all this mass stuff and vaccine and testing and all that goes away, because I think Hawaii is pretty strict, 
But Wailea would be one of the most beautiful spots on planet Earth. That guy I mentioned, Lister Summerall, he preached in every country and territory on planet Earth and said he never saw a place that was prettier than Maui. And I've been there, and I have not been all over the Earth, but that place, that, that's one of those places where, you know, I'm not like an artist or anything, but you'll like step off the plane and go like, wow. It's, it's just, it looks amazing. So I took my wife there, and they had a Ruth's Chris. And we had a little extra money, not a ton, but some. And I thought, you know what? I'm, go I'm going in. If we have to split a soup, I'm going in. <laughs> Preachers tried to talk me out of going here, I'm going. So I walked in, and we sit down, and we find out this was during the real estate crash in 2008. So because people's money had been affected, they were actually running a special that you could order one appetizer, two entrees, two side dishes, and a dessert. So you split the uh, uh, appetizer, you split the dessert, you both get two entrees, and they give you shared sides for $80 for two people. Now, that's not cheap, but $40 a person. I, mean, I could spend that at the taco truck. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If that taco truck's out there, you want to steer clear of me, I'll eat them until these buttons start becoming projectiles. <laughs> Take out a family of four before you get it stopped. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, I've, heard, I, I've been in the ministry quite a while. I've prayed for people that are addicted to heroin. I've prayed for people that are addicted to meth. I've prayed for people that are addicted to Percocet. I'll tell you, if I, if I don't get out of here in a couple days, I, I might have, I, I, you might be the first pe person ever go to rehab for Beria Tacos. <laughs> I'll be in withdrawals, eating imaginary tacos, dipping them. <laughs> if, I, if I don't have one of those tacos in about five hours, you might see a preacher here, here in Hobbs at two in the morning walking. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, if you see me later tonight, if you see me later tonight, don't, don't, um, don't be an enabler. If I come up to you at 2 in the morning at a gas station tonight, and I say, can I have some money for starving children? You say, you're not going to use that money on starving children. You're going to use it on tacos, aren't you? <laughs> because they don't have that where I live. I ordered uh, two orders on DoorDash before church started, and they canceled both my orders. I think they're sick of me. Think that guy's had enough tacos. We're not going to feed that addiction. <laughs> so we went in and we ordered 80 bucks plus tax. That, these, these people were talking like you, you had to be a rich person to eat there. It was easy. See, people tell you where you can't go. People tell you what you can't drive. You know, one of the things when I ate at that Ruth's Crinch and the preacher said, we can't eat there. I looked in the window one time, and there was a guy sitting in a booth with two women that were pretty and his age, so you know it's not his daughters. He's got two girlfriends. Couldn't even get one for like 21 years. This guy's in there <laughs> hogging them all, <laughs> smoking a cigar. And the thought, I didn't even know the stuff I'm preaching to you. But I thought to myself, because I came from like an old Pentecostal background where they were happy to be poor. But I thought to myself, explain to me. How a man that's committing adultery and smoking a cigar can have enough money to eat somewhere, but a child of God can. I'm going to tell you right now, you making a decision tonight to come to church, to obey the word, you're not making a decision to take a step down. You're making a decision to take a step up. God never changes anybody for the worse. He changes everybody for the better. Is it Isaiah 118? If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say a better amen? amen? You don't have to eat garbage and low, low cut food that's not even actually food that makes you sick. And I'm not talking about expensive food. I would take the steak taco, honest to God, the steak tacos they serve in Hobbs, New Mexico, Laredo, Texas, like actual Mexican food, I, I, I'd take it over Ritz-Carlton. I'd go eat at that taco truck in a vacant lot 
like I'm running from outstanding warrant <laughs> up with anywhere in the country. I'm not talking about spending a lot of money. I'm talking about who told you you have to be poor? Who told you you can't have a home? Who told you life has to be hard? Who told you your marriage won't work? Who told you you can't raise children to serve the Lord? It's not the Bible. And if you're looking for me to tell you that life's going to be hard, I'm going to tell you the opposite. I'm going to tell you God can take you when you're having a hard life. And if you do what he says, he can make all the hardness wash away. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I said his his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Say it out loud. It's a good thing to serve the Lord. One more time. Say it's a good thing to serve the Lord. It's not a step down to serve the Lord. It's a step up. You're not, you're not decreasing in life. God will pick you up. He picked me up. We used to sing a song. He picked me up. And turn me around. He set my feet on solid ground. He'll set your feet on higher ground. He'll make you to fly with eagle's wings. When God is for you, who can be against you? When Christ lives in you, the enemy has to bow out. This book's not full of fairy tales. This book is stories and records of actual men and women who were at the lowest but decided to call on God. And God picked them up out of the miry pit and he set their feet on the rock to stay. And that God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did for Abraham, what he did for Isaac, what he did for Jacob, he'll do for anybody that has faith to call on his name. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. I'll tell you another one while I'm thinking about it. Say it one more time. Say, if I'm willing... And obedient. and obedient. I'll eat the good of the land. I was shopping with my wife and another preacher and then a, a preacher and his wife. We were in a mall. I won't say what state. And this is, again, this is back. I probably had $200 to my name. It was the first year, the second year me and Adalis were married. And we walked by this store in the mall and the pastor's wife pointed at it and said that store has very expensive clothes no Christians can shop there <laughs> and I'm telling you back then I didn't know anything about prosperity but for what it, it must have just been the Holy Ghost I didn't I always had like a violent reaction to somebody talking down to me and telling me what I can't do so when she said Christians can't shop in this store I'd never been in the store I didn't probably didn't have the money to shop in that store but I thought if I, if I go buy a pen or a notepad, I'm going in there and buying something. And if I buy a notepad, I'm going to have them put it in the biggest bag they have. You know, like this. Don't tell me where, I, where my feet can't go. Well, that's expensive. What's expensive when your father owns all the silver and owns all the gold? What's, the, what's expensive when your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills? I have a dad. His name's Tiff Shuttlesworth. He's a good man. But when I got born again, my father's God. And my, so my family is a rich family. You ain't going to go up to Prince Charles and tell him he can't go eat at a steakhouse. You know, it's expensive in there. He's going to go, who is this guy? Does he not know who I am? He's the child of a king. He'll actually come to New York and make a phone call and say, I want to go shop with my wife at Saks Fifth Avenue. And they'll say, oh, it's closed. It's one in the morning. He'll say, call someone, tell them to open it up. Tell them I'm here. And they'll do it. I'll tell you, you guys seem, you, you don't seem like you have too much unbelief, so I'll tell you some stories that I haven't, haven't told too many places. There's a, a preacher named Benson Hosa. When he was born in Nigeria, Nigeria had less than 400 churches. When he died, he, he, he started over 9,600 churches in his lifetime. And his main flagship church Seated 17,000. When he was born, there was no church with more than 200 people in his country. When he died, Nigeria had a Christian prime minister and was over 50% Christian when before it was next to nobody. He had a different faith. 
And a, the pastor that was with him when it happened, and I've heard it from several other ones, he was in, now I'll tell you too, the first one will be easier for you to believe because it happened overseas. The second one's harder to believe because it happened in Newark, New Jersey. Because sometimes you hear about something in Africa, you're like, oh yeah, I guess you know, God actually does miracles in other places. So he's in Africa. He just, he preached on these scriptures. Joshua 1, wherever the sole of your foot will tread, you'll be on land that I've given to you. No man will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I'll give you the victory. Meditate on my words day and night. Let, them, let my book of the law never depart from thy mouth. Then you will be successful in everything you do. That's what the Bible says. Joshua 1.8. Then you will be successful in everything you do. That means you can have a successful marriage in 2021. You can, have a, you can raise your children successfully. You can be successful in business. Don't let people tell you how hard it's going to be. Are there challenges? Yes. Does God give you power to prevail over the challenges? Yes. Why do so many Christians focus on the fact that there's tests? I mean, no, in life there's tests. Yeah, and in school there's tests. But I'm not still in fourth grade, am I? Why? Because though there's tests, you can pass the test. I'm going to tell every one of you that's here on this Friday night, from now on you're going to pass every test that's sent your way in Jesus' name. Come on, put those anointed hands together one more time and give God the highest praise. Say it out loud. Life has tests, but I can pass all the tests. Then when you pass the test, you get something on the other side of it called a testimony. That's how, where they come from. I don't know what kind of story I'd have to tell if I decided to go home in Vermont, called my parents, asked if they could send me in a Dallas, a Greyhound bus ticket, go get a job locally in Bangor and quit the ministry. That's no testimony. The testimony comes when the test comes, when the devil goes out of his way to, to, to mess you up and you press through. You not only get the victory, you get a story to tell other people that inspires their faith. So I got something to tell you. God's not only going to bring you through to the other side, God's going to make your life a story that inspires the faith of other people. Where's my friend David Hurley? Oh, there you are. Come out into the aisle. I'm not praying for you. I want you to tell the people what you told me. Come to the front with me. So if you weren't here, David was on 32 prescription medications a day last year at this time, 53 weeks ago. And he'd have up to 40 seizures a day and five cluster headaches that are debilitating. And God saved him and delivered him off all the medication. But he came up to me today on Friday morning. This is what reminded me of it. Because I said when you get a testimony and you tell your testimony, then it inspires other people. Because do you think you're the only one going through what you went through? So tell, tell you, you don't have to tell who it is or anything, but tell what someone told you, this is after just a couple days. And you remember I called him out and said, the Lord's going to use you to make you the devil sorry he didn't kill you when he had the chance because people are going to hear your story and it, it's going to give them faith that if God can do that for him, he can do it for me. Tell him. Last night after service, I'm standing out here and a guy comes up to me and he tells me he's driving home from Roswell to Hobbs and he's watching Choose Life on his phone and saw my testimony and had to pull over because he was crying. He has a friend up in the mountains in Timuron, New Mexico, that's going through the exact same thing that I went through and asked if I would call him and try to get him down here. And they want you to pray for him. And they wanted me to pray for him. I've called him three times today. I didn't get a hold of him. Um, I'll try him again in the morning. Now, before you go back to your seat, now, is he going to have trouble praying for that guy? Even though it's a big thing to pray for him? Why? Because it's one thing to hear about what God's done. But when God's done it for you, you have faith. Because you don't believe in miracles, you is a miracle. God's going to make you a miracle in Jesus' name. Great job. Give my friend David a big hand clap as he goes back to his seat. Hallelujah. Say out loud, I don't just believe in miracles. I is a miracle. Yeah. It's one thing to know about what God can do. 
It's another thing when he's done it for you. He has done it for me. Well, ben, Benson had been through so many tests with the government putting hits out on him. But he just was different. So he had two missionaries from England <laughs> that were preaching at his church. And they couldn't get home because the plane, the flight out of Lagos or out of Benin City was oversold. He said, come with me. He goes to the airport, walks on the tarmac. That's a federal felony. If you do that on Grand Theft Auto, instantly five stars are blinking. <laughs> Don't laugh, they know you've played. He walks out on the tarmac and stands in front of the plane. And it slows down as it's taxiing, because there's a, and he would wear, they call it Babariga in, in, in Nigeria, wear the big white robe, white cap, big cross. He went like this. Plane stops. He motions them to lower the stairs off the plane. Gets on the plane with the two missionaries who are, who are like sheepish. He said, my friends here are preachers and they need to go back to Europe today. I need two of you to give up your seats. It's like a hijacking. So they, they look like, you know, first everyone freezes. I need two people to give up your seats right now. One person goes, another person goes. He tells them both to take their seats and walks off and goes back to the church. How did he not get arrested? I don't know. Now you hear about that happening in Africa and you think, well, that's Africa. Well, there's a preacher who built the largest word of faith church in the Northeast. His name was David Damola. He pastored in New Jersey. He flew Benson in to preach. And when they went to fly Benson out, there was a misprint or something. He missed his flight. The Plane's taxiing at Newark Airport. He walks up to the lady at the stand and says, get on the microphone and tell the pilots to pull the plane back that Bensonita Hosa needs to be on that plane. Wow. Lily looks at him, you know, it's New Jersey. I don't give a, who, who, who Bensonita Hosa is. She said, I'm not doing that. He, with authority. Get on the mic and tell the plane to come back. She gets on the, the mic Tell, well, they're not going to come back. It's already left. Tells them, Benson, there's a Benson to Hosa. He needs the plane to come back. He pulled the plane back and hook it up to the gate. And he gets on the flight. I know the pastor who was with him when it happened. The pastor's son-in-law was there, who I'm friends with. They, they, I know the people that were witnesses. And it's such an insane story that even when they tell you, you can tell they can barely believe it. They're like telling you, like, and it, it, it came back. It, it did. <laughs> Somebody say authority. authority. Say my feet have power. My, feet have power. My, words have authority. my words have authority. So when you show up somewhere, things change. When you're there, Jesus is there with you. Think of this. There was a man that was so violent that they had to keep him chained in the cemetery. No one could go through that region of the country of the Gadarenes, the Bible says, or that man would break his chains and assault whoever went through. But when Jesus stepped on the shore, the man ran out of the woods and he didn't attack Jesus. He knelt at his feet and began to worship him. Wherever the sole of your feet shall tread, you'll be on land that I've given to you. Not I'll give it to you. When your feet hit the ground, it belongs to you. The job that you want, that you're not qualified for. Schedule an interview and put your feet on the ground and see what happens. Because if this stuff works for steak dinners and everything else, surely for providing for your family. You lost your job, I'd make up my mind, I'm going to get one that pays 1.5 times as much to make the devil pay for the one I lost. Don't allow life to tell you how high you can go. Demand that life gives you what the Bible says. I won't have you yell stuff out all night, but say this. I won't take what I deserve. I'll get what I demand. Jesus demanded things. Jesus didn't say, well, hopefully there's an upper room that we can have a feast in. He said, go and tell the owner of that room, the master hath need of it, and he'll give it to you. When you go into the town, you'll find a donkey tied up. Untie it, and if anybody asks you what you're doing, tell them the master needs it. Commandeered boats, commandeered fish, commandeered coins in fish's mouth. I'm not preaching this for you to go around and go on a shoplifting spree on your way home. 
But I'm telling you a principle. That there's more power in your words than what you've even been taught. You don't have to put up with the devil's mess. You don't have to allow the devil to dictate. And that, 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 that for me is where the whole 2020 through 2021 came through. You're not going to tell me when I can preach. You're not going to tell me how many people I can have at my meeting. You're not going to tell me that I have to check people for vaccines before they come in. You don't determine my calling. My calling's been determined by God. So I resist the enemy and I have what God said is mine. So we, we, we're walking by that store. No, no Christians can shop there. I said to Dallas, let's go. And I said it so the lady could hear me that just said that. I said, Dallas, let's go in the store. If no Christians have ever shopped here, let me be the first. St. Jonathan of department stores. (laughs) So we walk in, and I told you my wife has much stronger faith than me. But she she has it for important things. So when we're walking in there, she's got Jonathan, you only have $207, right? And the bills are coming due in eight days. I don't need any of these clothes. (laughs) You've made your point. Let's go back out. And I said, no, you're going to get a gift in here out of spite. <laughs> so I remember it as clear as day. And it's funny because Adonis just cleared out all our, our whole home. I don't know whether she was watching Hoarders and got convicted or what. <laughs> she went on like a four-day, just cleared everything out. But she left. What I'm going to tell you, she, it's still there because, like I told you, when God does this stuff, it's more than a watch. It's more than shoes. It's more than a car. It's a sign. Imagine having a truck out there. It's more than just a Ford F-150 if the Lord gives it to you. Every morning you go out and look at it, you say, Jesus loves me. This I know. He even cares about what I ride. Amen. You want to put your kids in private school? God cares. I can't afford it though. God knows. He can afford it. He can afford to build another building just like it and not even miss the money. You're not limited by what you have. You're only limited by your faith. Bishop David Oyedepo, who came out from Bensonita Hosa's ministry, was ordained by him. He has an interesting statement because most of you in here are familiar with Mark 11, 22 through 24. You can say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. David Oyedepo said the only mountain any man ever has to move is the mountain of his own unbelief and ignorance. And once you move those two, every other mountain clears out for free. So what happens? How come, you, how come some of you don't have testimonies like the ones I'm talking about? Because some knucklehead with a mic and a suit. Yeah. How many know whether we ever have anything down here or not? One day like... That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was lifting people's faith. The Bible says you'll live in homes. Fine homes. Bible says you'll, you'll live in houses that you did not build. Remember the first thing I said? Take the Bible literally wherever possible. Do you know how many places I preached? That there's somebody building a building for you right now and they don't even know that they're doing it? Because the Bible says you'll live in homes that you did not build, which means somebody's building it for you without knowing it. And then a few weeks ago, somebody, somebody builds an office for us without knowing it and turns it over. The lady that gave it to us was, my, I talked to my wife before church, because we get along, you know. <laughs> she said the owner of the building, who is not a poor woman, is, is helping them clear the trash out to get the building ready for the, the buildings. They turned it over, and they're helping us clean it. And she started laughing. You know, my wife's Puerto Rican, Adalas. She's got a twin sister, Magalas, Puerto Rican wonder twins, we call them. They wear big earrings. So she was saying, I'm like your third sister. So they're buying her a pair of huge Puerto Rican flag earrings. And she's like, she's like a rich white lady. When you serve the Lord, life just gets fun. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Man, can I tell you some news? You're going to have the best year this coming year that you've ever had in Jesus' mighty name. I don't care what the devil has planned. I don't care what the Chinese have planned. I don't care what the United Nations has planned. I don't care if they're planning to shut the oil fields down. Nothing is going to touch you. Nothing's going to touch your family because you're a covenant child of God.
We go on that 21 days of prayer and fasting to start the year. The main reason we do that is we take the first days of the year. I'm not waiting to see what 2022 brings me. See if Joe Biden changes directions and is able to have a better. I don't, I'm not putting my destiny in the hands of dysfunctional alcoholics, which is basically what the political realm is. I've been to Washington, D.C. They all do their little thing, and they all go get plastered. That's why there's so many sexual assault allegations. I'm not waiting for, man, if my, let me tell you something. If I had to wait, do you know how fun it is that if Joe Biden decides to give a speech on Friday, I don't have to sit on the edge of my couch. It, are they going to let churches stay open? Are they going to close them back down for Christmas? I don't care. You talk all you want. I'm doing what God told me to do, and nobody can stop me. Oh, okay. Well, if you say so, I will. If inflation goes down, I'm blessed. If inflation goes up, I'm blessed. I'm not in this world's economy. I'm connected to the open window of heaven that's pouring out a blessing that's so great. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just walked into a $5.1 million building for free. It's mine. You don't, I don't, so what did building rates have to do with it? Well, they're not really giving out money for mortgages right now. Don't need it. If the Lord smiles on you, it doesn't matter how many people frown. If Jesus likes you, it doesn't matter how many people don't like you. If God loves you, it doesn't matter if everybody else hates you. If God is for you, no one can be against you. And I'm telling you, your enemies are clearing out of the way these next 12 and a half months, whether they want to or not. So we walk into that store. I took a dollars. I figured, well, if she's un uncertain about me being here, then probably won't buy me something. I'll buy her something. But a dollars is very difficult to buy for because she she don't she doesn't she really won't let you buy anything for. Her. I don't want that. I don't want it. So I took her to the shoes, and I said, buy buy some shoes. She went through Jonathan. These shoes are. Uh, do you know how much Jimmy Choo shoes are? I said, I don't even know who Jimmy Choo is. <laughs> Sound like an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> Jimmy Choo's. <laughs> C-H-E-W-S. It's not a bad business idea. Let's go to Jimmy Choo's. $5.99, all-you-can-eat. I said, uh, no, I don't, I don't know. She said, we have $207. She said, you can't even buy a heel on one of these shoes for $207. <laughs> Plus, I don't want anything. In mid-sentence, as she's telling me she don't want, she sees these boots. And I saw her eyes change. Oh, somebody wants something. I said, you like those boots? Oh, yeah. She picks them up. $1,299. Well, that's an easy buying decision. Don't have it. So without a loaded weapon, I can't have it. As Adonis picks up and looks on the price and her face drops, the sales lady comes over. You like those boots? Yeah. It's the last pair we have left. What size are you? Uh, I think she was a seven, seven back then. Oh, there's sevens. She said, um, you know, because they're the last pair and we're clearing it out, we have a mark down to, to 200. I think, no, I was saying 200. That was Vermont. We had 370, I think. Yeah. She said, we have a mark down to $307. 291, something like that. $1,299 boots. I said, we'll take them. The honest one, what about, that leaves us with 80 bucks. Jesus said, let tomorrow worry about itself. <laughs> I mean, come on, how are you going to pick up the boots and they got them 90% off and one pair left in your size? The same God that did that knows we got eight days left. So just chill. And we take them, she's smiling. I feel like you're stealing them. Puts them in, rings them up. 
We walk out, the pastor's wife that said that, the pastor and the other minister are standing there waiting for us. We walk out with a big bag that actually has a big thing in it. <laughs> and, she, and she goes, oh, you got something. What'd you get? I said, boots. How much did they cost? Dallas wanted to say, three, I, I said, $1,299 <laughs> they cost. That's what they cost. If I would have listened, and it's funny, when she cleaned everything out, right when I was packing to go on this trip, they were laying in my closet for some reason up top because she didn't want to get rid of them. And they're actually still in good shape. But she has them displayed differently than the rest of the shoes because those ones are different. Because it's not just about the heeled Jimmy Choo boots. It's about, it was a sign to us that God knew what Adalis wanted and had one set left just in her size in our price range. For all the bozos, payasos, that'll come in your life and tell you and get you to question how much God loves you, whether God cares about you, how, really the, the argument over prosperity is like how, yes, God loves us, but doesn't love us that much. No, I'm going to tell you something. If you'll go on this journey with God, you'll find out that his limit that he sets for you is so high. It's so further. If you dream the biggest dream you can dream, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what's never been entered into the heart of man, that's what God has reserved for all who love him. If you love Jesus, let him hear your loud amen. I don't know what has me on all these stories, but they just keep, when you talk about the goodness of God, I'll, I'll say when I talk about the goodness of God, more, more stuff just starts bubbling up on the inside of me. I was preaching in Alaska, Wasilla, Alaska, and we had a great revival meeting, similar, similar to like the July one, I mean, just blew up. And so he asked me if I could stay a second week, and I could, but I needed to preach in Texas on the Sunday. So I just flew to Texas and flew right back. And... Um, when I finish Friday night, it's an hour and a half to the Anchorage airport in Alaska. And I had to fly out at, at about 11. So I told him, I said, when I finish preaching, I'm going to give you the mic to close the service out. You know, sometimes, I don't know, some guys, like, they, never, they don't know how the ministry works. Like, give them the mic because you got to go. And they go, well, you're dismissed. And then I, then I can't get to my car. So I said, kill enough time that I can get out. Because I can't get stopped for prayer. You know, because the way I am... Yes, I have a flight at 11 p.m. that I can't miss. But what, are they going to wheel somebody up with stage four cancer? She needs prayer. I have a flight. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'll stop and pray and miss my flight. So I said, kill enough time that I can get to, to my vehicle. So I hand him the mic, go out the side door, and I start half running to my vehicle. <laughs> and literally, I'm going to get to Texas in time to preach. I, I think I preached in my same suit, like landed, preached the Sunday morning, flew right back to Alaska and did week two. So when I'm on my way there, running to the vehicle, this kid runs up beside me, 13 years old, and they, had, they sent an usher with me to walk me out to the car, like I was like some high-profile celebrity. But they had this Alaskan usher, like you guys have big guys, you can tell they're armed, you can tell most of them have killed people and buried bodies and stuff. They had those kind of ushers there. So this guy's walking out with me, and a, a young kid runs up, 13, and with tears in his eyes, he goes, here, mister. The Lord spoke to me to give you all my money. And it looked, it was on an envelope and he wrote it in pen. It was like $171 in some sense. There was change in it. This has happened to me one time, just that time. When he put it in my hand, I got a word of knowledge. I said, were you saving this money up to buy an Xbox? I'm trying to think how long. There was the 360. It was a few years back. I said, were you saving this up to buy an Xbox 360? He said, yeah. So he was saving the money up to buy an Xbox 360. He had saved up 171 so far. He needed, what, 200, 220 more. Yeah. I said, when I come back on Monday, uh, I'm going to get you an Xbox 360 and I'll have it for you in the service mo Monday night. Well, now think of that. The Lord saw what the desire of his heart was. And really, and don't clam up. I'm not taking an offering. You tell too many money stories in a row. <laughs> Where this is going. 
So you think about it. He, he, had work, he had saved up mowing grass and stuff. About half. Had about half to go. And help me as much as it helped that kid. Because I realized when God speaks to you about a seed. What he's doing is he's not saying, listen, I know you want an Xbox, but give it to me instead, and you can play with Lincoln Logs. No. Nobody under 50 is laughing. But anyway. What he's saying is, kid, quit trying to save up for the thing you want. Put it in my hand, and I'll do for you in one moment what you couldn't do in three years. So when he gave it to me, and I got that word of knowledge. I said, I'll have it for you uh, Monday night. He got so happy. The usher, big tough guy, starts crying. I'm thinking, man, this usher is one tender hearted guy. <laughs> so we walk to my truck and the kid runs away and he goes, can I tell you something? That's my son. He said, I lost my job three months ago and I knew he wanted that and it was paining my heart that I couldn't get it for him. And the Lord did that. Well, by the end of that week, the dad got a job. The kid got his Xbox. Now, listen, I know, I know there's people watching on YouTube. They don't like stories like that. You're one of those prosperity preachers. Oh, yeah. Worse than you can imagine. Because I've been broke. But I'm not broke anymore. And I know I'm not the one that did it. Jesus did it. God's word did it. Obedience to God's word gives you victory in every area of life. And God doesn't love me any more than he loves you. What he does for one, he'll do for anyone. He'll give you a job. He'll turn over property. He'll turn over house. Houses and lands. He loves you. He'll multiply you. He'll multiply your silver and gold. He is the God that giveth power to create wealth. Go ahead, take 30 seconds and rejoice. Clap your hands on ye people. Come on, make a joyful noise. Celebrate it ahead of time. The devil is defeated. Poverty is defeated. Lack is defeated. Begging your head the walls defeated stay on your feet everybody somebody say I got it, I got it. say this out loud on your feet say I receive it, I receive it. in my spirit first See, your flesh says, uh, when, I, when, I, I'll, when I see it, I'll believe it. That's not how it works with God. You believe it, and then your believing and speaking makes it visible. I used to tell guys in the denomination I was in, when I had 100 bucks in the bank, man, it's hard in the ministry, so it's not going to be hard for me. You know, you know, you don't have much money in the ministry. It's not me. I always have plenty. And they had more than me. So it's amazing how at that time they had more than me and I had next to nothing. But my words were right and their words were wrong and now they're not doing good. And, and I'm collecting buildings like they're sweaters. Your believing and your speaking is what dictates the course of your life. Well, how do you change what you speak? You can't just try to start. Well, he's right. I'm going to try to. How come I said strange things? Let's go in there and shop. I'm going to go put my feet on the ground of that Cadillac dealership. I'm going to go where they told me I can't go. Because the Bible says your speaking is predetermined by what's in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you have unbelief in your heart, Unbelief will come out of your mouth and you'll be one of those Christians. Are, nah, I know I shouldn't have said that. And forgive me. I'm trying to watch my confession. But when your heart is full of the word of God and faith, faith bubbles out without you trying. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say better? Amen. amen. Now you stand and I'll sit. Deuteronomy 8.1. Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply. Somebody say live. live. Say multiply. multiply. How can somebody knock increase 
When the Bible says, if you do what I tell you to do, you'll live and multiply. So how come other churches are talking about, I mean, no, you could die tomorrow. No, I'm going to live. I mean, no, sometimes we don't have, and multiply. God gave us, God gave my wife a pair of Jimmy Choo boots by a miracle. And now she buys them for other people all the time. That's called multiplication. When you go from somebody that's the receiver to the one that's the giver of the thing you used to not be able to afford. If Jesus tarries, mark, mark my words. Because this is how things work. Right now, I have my faith out to get a, a, an aircraft. Citation 10. I'm just saying it, not for you. I'm saying it so CNN can hear. Because I'll tell you how stupid the devil is. They'll run a special that I'm going after a Citation 10. Somebody will hear about it and give me one. Right. Off the story that they're trying to make me sound bad. That's how stupid the devil is. And this is, a, this is your daily reminder that there are still several people that work at CNN that aren't convicted sex offenders. Over four. Everybody say live and multiply. I got my faith out right now for a plane, but if Jesus tarries, there'll be, I'll have given several away. Because that's what multiplication is. You go from believing for something to sowing the thing that you used to have your faith out for. There's people in the sound of my voice that you don't own a home. That before Jesus comes back, you'll gift homes to other people. Adalis and I used to be re- late on the rent for our apartment all the time. We, we, we waved. We have two apartment buildings we own, and I waved the rent for the people that live there. Indefinitely. So you go from not being able to pay your rent to owning apartments and and forgiving the people's rent. Do you know why I forgive the people's rent? Because I remember what it was like. First of the month's coming due, we have, oh, $820, we don't have it. So we can either pay our rent or, and not eat, or we can eat and ask for mercy. I don't like that. I'm sure the people that live there can pay it easily, but I don't care. I need $5 million to break even. If it starts coming down to 800 a month, I'm screwed anyway. So might as well just give. Might as well just bless people. Might as well just do unto others what you would have others do unto you. And then watch God multiply it. I'm not saying if you own apartments, collect the rent. I'm just saying I I don't have any business sense. I got a suit like I know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I know this. And this works. Can you say amen? Amen. Everybody say, live and multiply. Live and multiply. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people don't live by bread alone. This is Deuteronomy 8. Rather, we live by every word that proceedeth. Now, I'm going to tell you why I like you people a lot. Because most people have very little value for the word of God. They want, they want food. Like if you gave the average person a choice between $10,000 or to sit and listen to somebody that carries a financial anointing that produces millions of dollars a year. I don't mean me. Pick one. They would take the 10000 but the 10,000 will dry up in less than four months. But the wisdom of God that produces the money never dries up. You think of this. Let's say they started, let's say the government started to move heavy against the church, like they're doing in Canada and different places. And let's say they made me public enemy number one, and they made an agreement with Chase Bank or PNC or whoever we use to freeze our bank accounts and seize our assets and take my property. I would have property and the same assets within a handful of days because when the Lord is your source and he qualifies you for a level, no one can ever reduce your level but you. I, I, don't, have, I don't just have the money. I have what it takes to produce the money. And I brought up Bensonita Hosa and David Oyedepo. That's what separated David Oyedepo. Bensonita Hosa came back from preaching in the United States and had a duffel bag full of U.S. dollars. Because he couldn't, 
that they gave him the cash while he was in the United States for what he was doing in, in Africa. So he's got this big duffel bag full of $100 bills sitting in the corner, and Bishop Oyedepo walked in because he taught at the Bible school. He was young, young like young. Early 30s, late 20s, hardly had any money. And Benson, without looking up, said, there's a duffel bag in the corner. Take as much as you want. And Bishop Oedepo sat down and said, I don't want the money. I want the wisdom you have that produced the money. And Benson looked up and Benson took him under his wing and taught him what he knew from the Bible. People would rather Kenneth Copeland send him a check for 25000 than listen to what Kenneth Copeland knows that took him from broke to what he is now. He's given 27 aircraft to other ministries. Not bicycles. I'm going to have you say another scripture with me before I pray for you. Say, walk with the wise and become wise yourself. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, he that walks with the wise will become wise himself, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Why have people lied to you? Why listen to people bad mouth money? You know, people go to a church. Did you know the anti-prosperity preachers? Like you listen to me preach. And if you think this is heavy prosperity, I'm giving you like whipped cream and cherry. I'm just telling you good stories. Well, he's a prosperity preacher. Did you know that the people that preach against prosperity, type in your favorite anti-prosperity preacher on Google and right next to it, net worth, and then get ready to grab your chest. They're lying to you. There's one famous anti-prosperity preacher, and I actually don't hate him, you know, because A, you're not allowed to hate people, and B, he kept kept his church open, so if you kept your church open, I would be afraid. If, you're, if you own a biker bar and you stayed open and defied the mandates, I, I can get along with you better than I can a pastor that shut down. I'm for freedom. So they took a picture, and the watch he had on while he was preaching is, is like a $9,000, $14,000 Rolex. And he preaches against prosperity, and we're supposed to suffer. And, he, and warns against prosperity preachers. Well, somebody snaps a picture of it and puts it on Instagram. So him and his board of directors issue a statement. That watch was actually given to him by, as a gift. Who cares? If it's wrong to have it. And secondly, you never ask any of the other people how they got theirs. Mine was given to me. My suit was given to me. This tie was given to me. This shirt was given to me. These shoes were a gift from Kofi, and the rest is none of your business. So, so you freely criticize everybody for what they have without hearing their story of how the Lord gave it to them. So if my wife was walking around in those Jimmy Choo boots, some more, there's a preacher telling people he's feeding the poor. Meanwhile, his wife's walking around in $1,400 boots. Yes, yeah, she is. But we didn't pay that for it. The Lord, the Lord gave it to her like they were Nikes. So don't criticize my blessing. I'm not critical. When I see you could drive here in a chrome wrapped Bentley on Monday, you think, oh, no. I wonder how much they give in my offering. You, gotta, you don't owe me a penny. God takes care of me. And I'm telling you, God will take care of you. You actually couldn't get blessed enough. You couldn't get blessed enough for me to be happy for you. Whether you gave any money or not. What do you think? I check our financial records? I play video games in my free time. (laughs) Told you that three times. You think I know how much you've given to our ministry? We hit a point a while back where I don't have the capacity to keep track. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know who it's coming from. We got got like a $40,000 check the other week from a, um, a a break service company in New Zealand. Never been there. Never plan on going there. I'm not on TV there. I'm not on TV. New Zealand. Now, you New Zealand people, if you could ask the Lord to plead. No. I don't know where it comes from. It comes from his hand. I'm faithful to sow. God speaks to people. And you reap. Hallelujah. Uh, the guy has a 
guy has a Cadillac. I wonder how much he puts in the offering. I don't care how much you put in the offering. The Bible says to give. It doesn't say anything about Jonathan Shuttlesworth in there. You're free to give wherever you want. My, my blessing's not determined by the church people's giving. My blessing's determined by my giving. And I've made sure, and I want to tell you, I'm looking forward to next year because this year we gave $1.1 million to other ministries and widows and stuff like that. And I'm looking forward to the harvest. I got a harvest with my name on it. You got a harvest with your name on it. It's not under the control of the U.S. government or the Federal Reserve. You're blessed in Jesus' name. Say it one more time. I'm blessed. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Lift both hands up. Say, thank you, Jesus. You're bringing me into a good land. Put your hands down and look up at me. I mean, you, know, there's, you can expect suffering. I'm not expecting suffering. I'm expecting the devil to suffer. I'm expecting those that try to come against the gospel to suffer. God's not bringing me into a wasteland. God's not bringing me into a pit. He brings people. God doesn't put people in a pit. He brings people out of the pit. He's bringing you into a good land. Get ready for the best year that you've ever had. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams, pools of water. They were in the desert. I said, you're not going to have to look for water. There's going to be flowing streams, pools of water, fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. When you get home, not now while I'm preaching to you, but when you get home, go on Google Maps and look at Israel and then zoom out. Do like the actual earth view, not like the roads and stuff. Like the earth view. Look at Israel and then zoom out. There's nothing. The Iran, sand. Iraq, sand. Everything around them, nothing. And then right. Why do you think everybody's so obsessed with taking their land? Water. Watermelons, strawberries. They export produce to all the... They don't have enough for their nation. They, they export food all over the world. And see, people are stupid. They think if they attack them and take their land, that then now they'll have food. But it's not the land that's blessed. It's the people in the land that are blessed. You can live in a desert, but if God's hands on your life, flowers will bloom in the desert and water will gush forth for you. If you believe it, shout aloud. Amen. amen. Verse 12, for when you've become full and prosperous, I don't believe in prosperity. Okay, then rip this page out of your Bible, but it's there anyway. For when you've become full and prosperous. And have built fine homes, plural, to live in. And when your flocks and herds have become very large. And your silver and gold. You know, these prosperity guys, like Pastor Dean, they teach that if you give in the offering, God will multiply your money. But if you read the Bible, he doesn't talk about money. He's talking about sheep and goats and livestock because back then they lived in an agrarian society in Mesopotamia in 8,000 B.C. It doesn't, it doesn't just say he'll multiply your and, er, herds and flocks. It says he, along with it, he'll multiply your silver and gold. Do you think they didn't have money in Bible times? I, I listen to some Bible scholars, and the scholar should be replaced yeah. with payaso. <laughs> they didn't have money in Bible times. Oh, yeah? Then what, why did uh, Jacob tell his sons yep. when they needed food, go down to Egypt and take double yeah. money? They've always had currency. What do you think people were walking around with like nine goats to do trading? <laughs> God said, he'll multiply your money. I said, God said, he'll multiply your money. I said, God said, he'll multiply your money. I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose a grace to you tonight that I've received. From now on, you're not going to get to the end of the month and ask where'd all the money go. 
You're going to get to the end of the month and say, how's all this left? Where did all this come from? I'm going to tell you, the Lord will flip it like a switch. When the Lord first started pouring out his blessing on Adonis and I, we'd get to the end of the month. And instead of not having enough, we'd have plenty extra. And we would we'd think, well, the electric bill must have not cleared. You know, because that stuff happens when you're broke. They tell you you paid your bill. Then they come back, I actually didn't pay it. So we've already deducted $300. Right, well, great. Thanks. Now I can't eat. Thank you. <laughs> Throw the phone through the wall. Kick the TV. And I'm telling you, I don't know how it happens. It's supernatural. But the same way how you didn't know where all the money went, yeah. and you start yelling at your wife, she starts yelling, did you buy boots? Did you go out to Buffalo Wild Wings? You're trying to find out where the money went. You'll get to the end of the month, I know all the bills are paid. And how do we have, you're making the same money. But the same money blessed is different. It never runs out. The cruise of oil and the jar of meal will never, ever, 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 ever run dry. And when your flocks and your herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Don't become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Don't forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I've achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. So th there is a warning there for a reason. You need to make your plans now about what you're going to do when God blesses you. You're going to go get your house on the lake, and Pastor Dean doesn't see you from May through September. <laughs> Pastor Dean, you know, we like going away now. <laughs> That's where you're diff, we're rich now. You're going to be in church less because you have more money, or you're going to be in church more because you have more money? <laughs> and here's where I part company with a lot of people. Because the mistake anti-prosperity people make is they say, see, the Bible tells you there that when God blesses you, You'll, you'll, you'll go off. And I, I, I've known people that the Lord blessed them. They don't go to church anymore. It doesn't say that's going to happen. It says be careful. There's a tendency for you to start thinking you did it. Have you ever heard me stand up when I'm preaching and say, before I start, I just want to say to all our partners online, I thank you. Without you, you're the reason we're able to come here. No, you know who's the reason I'm able to come here? Jesus. Do you know who gave me the partners? Jesus. So I thank them. I'll send them a thank you letter when they give. But you'll never hear me say, without you, I couldn't preach. Because God, oh, really? No. Jesus did it. The Word did it. I said the Word did it. Now you say it. Say the Word did it. What are you going to do when the Lord starts blessing you? Start telling everybody about it. how good you are at investing. How hard you work. You're going to tell your grandkids that grandpa, well, you see, I have because grandpa works hard. No, don't tell them that. Tell them about the blessing of Abraham. Because you couldn't work hard if you were dead. So the God that kept you alive, the God that put breath in your lungs, the God that opened the door, use your wealth to point people to Jesus. So when people say that you can't be blessed and still keep God first, well, you know, money will take the place of God in your heart. Is David in hell? Is Abraham in hell? Is Isaac in hell? Is Jacob in hell? Is Joseph in hell? So don't tell me I can't be blessed. I can actually be like my father Abraham, and the more God blesses me, the harder I press into God. I have the most money in the bank personally and in the ministry that we've ever had, and I've never preached till December 22nd. I got enough money. I could have gone away from Thanksgiving till the church starts January 1st. Yeah. Hey, you know, we need a break. Just gonna... No, I made up my mind. I can do it. Yeah. But I told the Lord, the more you bless me, you're going to watch a strange man. That the more reason you give me to take a break and chill and see what you've done, I'm going to press in for souls and evangelism harder than I ever have before.
That Pastor Dean at Shoes Lake Church, he kept his church open during COVID. He must really need that tithe money. Does he strike you as a man that's mismanaged his money? Do you think at 75 he has nothing for, to retire on and needed people to give during COVID so he could eat beans? <laughs> you freaking knucklehead. Sorry. I promised that lady from Albuquerque I want to say freaking tonight. Sorry about that. Sometimes it just comes out. I don't like when people say mean things about my friend. You might say, oh, that's what they thought. They thought preachers were keeping their church open because they need offerings. You don't need any offerings. I've been around broke people. He's not one of them. There's some people that actually do what they do because they love people and they want to point them to Jesus. And you got a pastor in this church that's one of them. Verse 18. Always remember, it is the Lord your God who giveth the power or anointing, who has anointed you, who gives you supernatural ability. In Spanish, unción, an unction to create wealth. That his covenant that he swore to your fathers would be established on the earth. It is the Lord who giveth the power. Not to meet your needs, to create wealth. If you would have told me in Vermont when I had minus $300 in the bank, minus 337, that one day 21 families would draw their full-time living from the excess of our ministry. And we'd feed 1,500 kids a day when I was, Taco Bell was at the top of my list for me. No feeding other kids. Actually, that's why I waited so long to have a kid. We can't feed no third person, having our hands full with two. Jonathan, I've noticed you fast a lot. Yeah, not all of it's voluntary. You go from barely being able to feed you and your wife to feeding fifth. Actually, with that ministry, Feed the Hungry, we're now the largest giver to that ministry. I started off doing 40 kids a day, and the blessing just kept growing. I'm telling you that to tell you this. Don't mind where you are now. Focus on where you're going. If the devil can get you short-sighted on where you are now, eh, if it would have worked, it worked by now. It doesn't, I guess it doesn't work for everybody. Then that's why the verse comes, be not weary in well-doing. God wouldn't have written that unless there was a tendency to become weary in well-doing. For you shall reap. If you don't give up and quit. Lift your hands. And I want you to take 30 seconds with your hands lifted. Just begin to thank the Lord. And I'm going to join you. Every person with your hands lifted. Take 30 seconds and just out of your mouth. Begin to thank God in advance. That 2022 is going to be the best year. That you've ever had. Lift up your voice. Begin to thank him. Thank you Lord Jesus. Fifteen more seconds, lift him up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you in advance. Fifteen bonus seconds. You sound good. Doesn't sound like the prayers of an American church. Let it bubble out of your spirit. Thanksgiving multiplies. You're so good, Lord Jesus. How many of you came from that town in Texas? Th three? Let me have you all stand out in the aisle. I'm going to pray for the middle one first. Put both your hands where your lungs are. The Lord's going to give you two brand new lungs and a brand new heart. You'll never have COPD. 
and you'll never have uh, emphysema or any other kind of infirmity that attacks the lungs. Amen. Yeah. What? Tell me why you say, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. She's had a heart, triple five pounds, quadruple bypass. Quadruple Twelve bypass. Heart Twelve heart attacks. And diagnosed with COPD. Well, good. I feel good. See, the Lord knew. Underneath both your hands, the Lord gives you two brand new lungs and a brand new heart. We've never talked, right? You didn't, you didn't fill out a prayer request for him. And I have an earpiece and my wife's reading the forms of me in the back. That lady has COPD. Everybody say, Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Actually, when you guys raised your hand and I saw you, so I just waited till, till now. But I felt the Lord speak. Because she took time to drive all that way and came, you know, to be, to meet with me. At the end, tell her I have a gift for her. And that's it, your gift. Just close both eyes. Now, how many heart attacks? Twelve. Okay. One for each disciple. That's great. So if you've had 12 heart attacks, you don't need God to heal your heart. You need a new heart. And that's what I told you. Lord's going to give you two new lungs and a new heart. Keep your eyes closed. Keep your hands right where they are. Underneath your hands passes the power. And I just had you guys stand by her so she didn't feel singled out. Love you. You know, I wish, I wish people wouldn't segment God. The God that knows what shoes my wife likes, knows who needs a new heart. To him, it's all the same. Whether people need bread and fish, whether he wants to bless you with, whether you need a, 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 an extended cab SUV for your TV equipment, or for you, your oil equipment, or whatever. It's all the same to God. He supplies all your needs. I needed an extended cab SUV. God gave me the best. That lady needs heart and lungs. God has it for her. Everything you need is found in God. You'll never have to go outside of him for anything. My friend from Albuquerque, come right out, power of God's all over you. With a nice scarf on, come right out. Sorry, I'm sorry for my language tonight. <laughs> sorry. Come right. Lift both hands, close both eyes. Power of God's all over you. Take more. Life won't be hard anymore. Life won't be a struggle. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for a couple more people. This lady with the thing wrapped around your wrist. This lady with one wristband. Like you're a tag team WWF fighter. Come right out. Yes, you. Nice to meet you. Lift both hands right where you're at. Put one hand on your belly. The Lord's going to do a miracle on the inside of you. Praise the Lord. Why is everybody looking at me like we're in a Catholic church? <laughs> Lift your hands. The anointing's here. Don't clam up when the Spirit of God starts moving. He has blessings for you. If you'll reach out with your faith, He'll give you whatever you desire. You can leave here. Like what your plan is, if everything works right, to have by the end of the next year, you can actually receive it tonight. 
God will make it happen. God will make it happen. Praise the Lord. Don't clam up. I'm not walking around with a switchblade. Just walking around seeing what the Lord wants done. I'm his servant. He loves you very much. Life's not going to be hard anymore. Life's not going to be difficult. It's not going to be difficult to raise your children. It's not going to be difficult to keep your marriage together. The Lord's going to help you. What you were unable to do, God's going to give you the strength to do it with ease. There's nothing that's happened that God can't take you out of the situation and restore everything that was lost. And he doesn't need time. He needs faith. If you believe him, he'll do it tonight. I already know in my spirit you're going to enjoy a peaceful weekend. You're going to sit and just giggle to yourself, already confident of everything God's done. My two friends here, both of you two, step right out. So, I don't know if you two know each other, but the Lord's going to deal with you both at once. Lift both hands, close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes upon you. Even stronger. Lift your hands up even higher. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Go right into you. Receive a miracle. More. That's it. More. More. In Jesus' name. Glory yes. for you. Anything you desire from the Lord, take it now. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Keep your hands lifted. Take one more half lap. This lady in the second row, let's come right to the middle. Lift your hands right there, close both eyes. As you do, the power of God comes upon you. That's it. While you were serving here, you got a desire in your heart to do a big thing in the ministry, and you wondered, is that me or is that God? The Lord confirms tonight that his hand's upon your life, and he's going to use you mightily. Jesus mighty name. Amen. Let me pray for uh, the one sister that's going to uh, Bible school. Lift your hands right there. Close both eyes. Jesus name. Amen. I'm going to pray for three ladies and then I'll leave you alone for a little bit. Actually four. You, if you, let, you mind if I pray for you with the sweater on? Come right up. I won't do anything weird. You know, I'm not weird. You don't, you don't have to, I don't do weird stuff. We're not going to pass around snakes or anything. <laughs> nice to meet you. Put your right hand across your heart and lungs. Lift the other hand up to the Lord. And then, different from the lady that had the 12 heart attacks, God's not only going to touch your heart and lungs, but he's going to give you a clean bloodstream. Actually, then take this hand and put it down where your liver and pancreas are. Kidneys. So your lower organs and then the heart And then the final one, you, you, and you in the camouflage. Come right up. Ushers, help her around that lady. Here, come right up. Stand shoulder to shoulder right here. Just stand right across. I'll come right back. See, you'll never be the same after tonight. You're not going to have to struggle with infirmity.
you're healed. Now, listen, if I held the mic up to her mouth, she's saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Some, some churches that teach that God doesn't heal anymore, then when God heals people, they say they do that by demon power. Well, that's a very strange demon that gets people to say, thank you, Jesus. You're smoking some, you're eating some bad mushrooms. All three of you, stand shoulder to shoulder, lift both hands, close both eyes. Uh, I'll say it like this. Life has been very difficult from the time you were very young till now. It's like you carry a heavy load. People that were supposed to help you bailed on you and didn't help you. And uh, you actually got stuck trying to help. You don't even have enough to help you. And then you're helping other people that are in the same boat. And you all don't have enough. So the Lord right now lifts that heavy burden that you've carried. And I tell you this from the Lord. Life won't be hard anymore. That's why the Lord had me tell stories like I told tonight. Imagine walking into a store and the thing you need is there and it's 90% off for some. It's like that. Where, and then just one thing after another where it takes like four or five times if you're thick-headed before you go, wow, God's helping me. You're going to see the Lord help you. I'll tell you one more thing. Early death stops with you. Whatever you've been around where people die early, you'll never die early, and it puts a stop to it. Now, in Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. I know you probably felt you were safe sitting in the back, but I move around. <laughs> and God loves the people in the back as much as he loves the people in the front. Amen? Yes. One more time, say, Jesus loves, me. Jesus loves me. Now, if you stare at the ceiling and pretend like you don't see me, then I'll know not to pray for you. <laughs> I don't know why people get nervous when the Holy Ghost starts moving. If you'd receive him, he has good things for you, not bad things. Is he gone yet? <laughs> Someone say, God has good things for me. <laughs> say, I make a decision, make a decision. To, receive them. to receive them. So lift your hands one more time and just receive them. Say something like, Lord, I receive. Lord, I receive. And I mean, just talk to him. I receive the good. God's not a pagan God. He doesn't like chanting. I just was trying to get you started. Lord, I receive. I receive your best. I receive in advance 2022 the blessing of God. 2022 will be a land flowing with milk and honey. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Everything started when I read those blessing scriptures, especially like Deuteronomy chapter 8. It all starts with if you'll fully serve the Lord your God. I think it said in the beginning, the middle, and then at the end. Don't forget the Lord your God. If you fully serve him, forget not the Lord thy God. So the Bible's telling you that the key, the master key, is putting God first. And that's why the devil tries to work through sin, compromise, getting you to do things. That lady that just got up, before you go back to your seat, lift both hands all the way up again. Lord has a second touch for you.
Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you say, Jonathan, I can't say with a pure heart that I have fully served the, the Lord or, or ever made a commitment to serve the Lord. I don't know how you came here, whether somebody invited you, you saw it online or whatever. But man, to be in church on a Friday night and sit through a 90-minute sermon, two-hour sermon, which you might have never done in your life, you have to at least feel like God might be trying to get a hold of your heart. Jesus is coming soon. God wants you saved. He doesn't want you lost. And he wants you to live in the blessing of God until he comes back. So if you're here tonight and you found either of the, these two groups, either there's never been a time in your life where you've repented of sin. Sin separates you from God. You got to get rid of sin or sin is like a spiritual cancer. It'll destroy you. It'll destroy everything God wants to do in your life. If you've never taken time at the altar and given that to the Lord, do that tonight. Secondly, if you once did that, but you entered back into the thing God delivered you from, or you started to make room in your life for things the Bible calls sin, and you say, Jonathan, I'm not living a pure and holy life. I've allowed my, myself to lower myself to the standard of America in this world. But tonight I give myself back to the Lord. I'm gonna give my whole self to God and I'm not putting it off one hour. If you're here and you fall into either of those two categories and you, you need to come to the Lord, I want you to put your hand up high and wave it at me right now. We're gonna pray. Lift your hand, tonight's your night. I need to get, I see your hand. Who else? I see you in the back. I see you in the back. Lots of men. That's great. I see you in the center. Anyone else? The Lord's dealing with your heart tonight. I see you, young lady. I see you, sir. God's dealing with people's hearts right now. This is holy. Everyone that lifted a hand and meant business with God. I want you to come down to the altar and join me right now. We're going to pray. Come right now. Come boldly. Come on a shame. Jesus loves you. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, sir. Keep coming. Tonight's your night. Tonight's your night. Come right to the middle. Jesus loves you. God bless you. Who else? I see people still coming. That's great. This is your hour. God bless you. God bless you. Man, I'm happy. Lift both hands to the Lord. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And as you pray this prayer, God's going to take out your old heart and give you a new heart. And you'll serve the Lord with a passion. It's going to change the whole course of your life as you stay with that commitment. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. I turn my back on sin. I say yes to Jesus. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord and my Savior. Right now, I receive forgiveness. By the blood of Jesus, I am saved. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me pray for you with your hands lifted. I bless you in the name of Jesus. The arrows of the wicked won't harm you anymore. Like I told those women in that aisle, life won't be hard anymore. Won't be you doing the best you know how to do and nothing works out. The Lord will fight your battles for you. God will give you strength where you are weak. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for my friend I made last night. Lift your other hand to the Lord. I tell you that. Life's not going to be hard anymore. The Lord's going to help you. That's the power of God flowing into you right now. You did everything you knew to do. You stood as strong as you could. 
and nothing still would work. But from tonight, things will be different. For the Lord will help you. Be filled. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. 